into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then we'll go down to verse 17, chapter 17 of verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Then go to chapter 18, will you please? And uh, I, I want to look down at uh, verse 24. Uh, in, in her, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Nine, chapter 19, verse 1. After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. Now we'll pray. Father, please help us today as we desire to discern not only the meaning of the text today, but God, the application for it. And I just ask that you would help us. Lord, help us for the next <clears throat> several minutes to be able to set aside all of the things that weigh on our minds and that distract us and that God ultimately aren't even as important, no matter what they are, as eternal matters. And I just pray uh, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are at the most vivid part of the Revelation. Matter of fact, it actually surprises me when people try to talk to me about Revelation and they haven't really studied it and they haven't actually really read it. It always surprises me how people always come to this portion of Revelation. They talk about how that, you know, the armies of the earth go out and, and uh, meet the Lord in, in Armageddon and and uh, this great battle between good and evil, really God and the nations of the earth, and this great whore, which is Babylon. And uh, they kind of know the army scene, the scenario. In other words, and I, I don't know whether Hollywood or other uh, films have made an actual uh, depiction of this. I suppose it, now that we have animation, it can more easily be done than it could before you have all of these scenes which are just something that you just couldn't duplicate. You couldn't make. They're, they're really apocalyptic, literally. And uh, so that's what a lot of people know about. But what a lot of people don't understand is what's actually going on with the whole eternal aspect of it. In other words, what's the purpose? What's the point of these nations of the world coming out against God? A common theme that we have seen as we've studied through the Revelation is that in spite of whatever judgments that God's hand meets out toward man, sinful, wicked, rebellious, unrepentant man, the response is that in spite of this, men repented not. But they blasphemed God. And that's astonishing to me. Now, we are in the period that is the last week of Daniel. If you study Daniel chapter 9, and you look in particular uh, verses 27 to the end, when we look at the 70 times 7 weeks of Daniel, before the Messiah would be born, uh, there was one week that was going to be left because he was going to be cut off. We're in that final week, Daniel's final week. Now, the church has for years called it the seven years of tribulation. 
Today, a lot of people are running or attacking that phrase, which is just fine. Uh, let, me, let me just go on a little bit of a caveat here, if, if you will, please. You know, a lot of people have trouble with terminology because we've used terms to name a Bible teaching or a Bible doctrine. For instance, <coughs> rapture. The word rapture is a Greek word. It simply is a word that means snatch or to grab, to suddenly take up. And uh, suddenly take up is probably the best description for the rapture. But we don't have one word that works for those three words in the English language. So we transliterate a Latin word, uh, which is not in the Bible. It's just a word that works. And we, uh, being a Latin derivative na uh, language anyway, English, a lot of our words come from Latin and other derivatives. So we use the word rapture. And a lot of people attack that word rapture uh, say, oh, there's no rapture in the Bible because the word isn't in the Bible. Well, the teaching of the doctrine is in the Bible, and the rapture is a word that describes it well. And uh, there, another word like this, Jehovah's Witnesses attack the word for the doctrine of the Godhead, that is the Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three are one. They're all God, and they're one person. God's three persons, but He's one person. You say, Pastor, how? I don't know how God is God, but He is, and He's proven it. So that's all there is to it. And I think that's enough for us. You know, if you could understand how God could be God, then you could figure out how to be God. But you cannot. God is superior to us in every way, and He's got some advantages as well in the area of, first of all, being uh, not having a beginning or an end. You know, we have beginnings and ends, and we have even limited amount of years on this earth. If God were only as old as mankind, he'd still be 7,000 years old and therefore a great deal more experienced than any of us. Right? And so he'd definitely be a veteran when it comes to knowledge. But God isn't only 7,000 years old. God is eternal. And so sometimes we as believers want to relate to God from the perspective of humanity. Now I'm not trying to just throw words at you this morning, but I want you to think about this. We oftentimes try to relate to God from the perspective of humanity. And God's not just a man. God made man. We're a creation. Now some of you possess great talents and abilities. I look around this room today and actually I see many people. And every person I see, actually I can think of particular things that you're skilled at. That you're good at. That, and uh, many of you can make things or work at things and produce things that in my mind are impressive. But none of them compare with God's prized creation, which is you. In other words, the best thing you can make, if you want to compare it to any person that God has created, you just couldn't make anything like that. You see what I'm saying? In other words, God is so far beyond, so much greater than we are, that it is just fine for us to simply say, I don't know how God does it, but He has done it and proved it. And so that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me to just believe God. Now I can search something out and I can study as much as may be known about God in His Word. And uh, when I know that, I'll know as much as may be known, but I can't know everything about God because I'm not, I don't have the intellectual capacity. And you say, well, Pastor, we all know that. Well, now that you've insulted me, it's my turn. No, not really. Uh, <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that we don't, none of us do actually, do we? All right, so here we are at a place when we're using a term, the seven years of tribulation. I just want to tell you something. It's not a problem to talk about seven years of tribulation. But we could perhaps, because of, of naysayers or people that attack the doctrine, uh, the Bible teaching of Daniel's 70th week, you could call it that, in calling it the tribulation, we could say the tribulation at the hand of God and qualify it in a way that distinguishes it. You say, Pastor, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, you, well, here's what, I'm, here's what I'm saying specifically. There are people today that try to say that persecution at the hand of man, uh, which the Bible calls tribulation, is equivalent to judgment at the hand of God. My friend, men have done and are capable of doing some pretty terrible things. Think of the cross. It's a pretty terrible thing that man is capable of doing or perpetrating. 
Despite that reality, my friend, is very different than God who not only judges mankind, He judges the earth. Now there are some things, uh, and, and so you understand when we talk about the seven years of tribulation, we're not talking about phenomenons. Natural occurring phenomenons. You know, there's something going on in the ground and it causes an earthquake and a volcano and it's a massive phenomenon that it affects a lot of people or something that we would call an act of God. No, we're talking about the heavens being rolled back like a scroll and seeing the throne room of God in heaven and seeing uh, these judgments which God has meted out on man specifically. Say, now go and do it. And an angel pours out a judgment. And we're in this seven vials of the third woe of judgment. So seven angels have seven vials and they're pouring out these judgments. I'm sorry, everybody's looking at me kind of glassy-eyed right now. And that's because it's not possible for me to review everything to take us into our context today. But specifically today, we're looking uh, past, or we're looking at the final judgment when God, the culmination of these seven years of, um, of escalating events, judgments at the hand of God. Did you notice? They started, well, you know, a third part of the trees on the earth were born, burned. That's pretty terrible. But now things are getting really, really terrible. And now God is actually destroying the wicked. The wicked themselves are being destroyed. Last week, we preached a message and we called it the case against God in chapter 16. We looked at what God ends up doing uh, when... The, the seventh angel uh, pours out, or the third angel poured out his vial on the rivers. The first angel poured out his uh, vial uh, on the earth. And remember, there was a sore, grievesome sore, and uh, noisome sores on men. All the waters on the earth turned to blood. The rivers turned to blood. The seas turned to blood. The oceans turned to blood. Uh, the fountains of the earth turned to blood. And we looked at it as, wow, what did the earth ever do to God? Well, it wasn't about the earth. It was about man who is supposed to possess the earth or have dominion over the earth. The earth was made for man. And the reason it was turned to blood was because these are individuals that desired the blood of the saints. In other words, they were bloodthirsty, and God said, here's all the blood you can handle. You look at it, it's just absolutely terrible. And again, we saw that same theme today with this mystery woman Babylon. Will you please go with me uh, in chapter to chapter 17? And uh, I want to just read uh, the, uh, several of, of the first verses. Beginning really at verse 3, John said about this, this angel who's showing the, one of the seven angels with the vials, showed him this woman who is described as the great whore. So he carried me away in the spirit unto the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And that word fornication is really the key. You know, it, it happened that a few months ago, uh, that, that if, Joel, could you get the door, please? It happened that a few months ago in 1 Corinthians, we saw chapters 7 all the way to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, we saw the theme of fornication. And one of the things that we saw as we preached through that portion of the Scripture is that fornication is in intimately connected with idolatry. It's interesting when you study and you look at false gods, false worship, worship of idols and false gods, one of the things that you'll discover is that worship and fornication are connected. Worship and uh, sexual sin are connected. And so, hey buddy, come on in. He's new here. He's never been here before, but it looks like somebody would be fun to grab. <laughs> All right. so, hey, Anthony, open that door. Open that door there and usher him in. Yeah, just quickly. There you go. <laughs> All right. Lock him down. All right. <laughs> there we go. 
and escape. When cute children escape, there's no way in the world you can preach and have anyone pay attention. So, <laughs> all right. Um, now let me let me try to remember what where I was at. What I was saying. Okay, we we're talking about the connection between idolatry and fornication. False worship always has connection with it. For instance. When there are temples for idolatry, there are always temp there, there's temple prostitution. Uh, it's interesting, false religions, how connected um, sexual sin, uh, sexuality is with it. And that's the attraction. You ever ask yourself the question, if you've ever studied, for instance, Islam. Uh, I, I saw something come up on social media that I posted three years ago, and I reposted. It's probably, probably offensive to some people, but it's so true that I reposted again today. And it said something like this, um, Muslims want peace so badly, they're willing to kill everyone in order to achieve it. It's pretty true, isn't it? In other words, Muslims, you know, they want peace so badly, they're willing to kill anyone that doesn't agree with them, and then they, they can have peace. And, and uh, the, the motto of the Muslim is, the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. In other words, they're all enemies. When they get done killing the worst enemy, they kill each other. And that, that really, I'm not making that up. Read, read the hadiths, uh, read the Quran. If you haven't, don't judge me. You're making a harsh judgment without knowledge. If you have, uh, but one of the things that about Islam, when you read the hadiths, that you realize is that it is all about sexuality. I don't want to be crude or inappropriate here today, but it's all about being able to commit fornication and uh, for for men to have. Uh, you know, not one, not two, seventy hundreds of women, and for it to be acceptable and okay. And in conquest and in battle, there are it's, there are no rules uh, with homosexuality, with um, tragically, uh, with pedophilia, uh, all these things. It is part of the religion that in these scenarios, it's okay for you to do these things, and that's the attraction of Islam. That's, you, you ever ask the question, why would someone ever want to be a Muslim? Well, because you get to steal things from people and you get to do things that, that should be, that are abominations and that are actually illegal in, in any kind of uh, God-fearing place. Okay, what's the point of that? You know, Mormonism's the same way. <coughs> Joseph Smith never made it on his pilgrimage to go out west. But did you know that what Joseph Smith did when he was when he was on his way out is that he murdered countless individuals, and that uh, he plundered <coughs> scores and scores of people. Uh, there, well, of his forty-nine wives, you know that most of them all had husbands, uh, other men that were their husbands. You say, well, Pastor, that just is evil. Yeah, it's kind of forgotten, isn't it? It's not. We don't make much about it because we're too polite. Or too merciful, I think. It, that's just not mercy. But the reality of it is, is that idolatry and fornication are absolutely connected. What's the tra attraction to this city, this great Babylon, which is called the whore fornication? That's the attraction to it. And so what she is holding in her hand, here's this description of a red beast. We know... Uh, who the beast is. He's the one that has been given power by the dragon or the serpent, the devil. And here she is riding this beast really in, 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 uh, as, a, as a show of her glory. The scarlet covered beast and she is, has ten heads and she has pearls and she's holding a golden cup which is full of these abominations and fornications. And that's description of this woman. Now this woman is of course a city. For years... Uh, individuals have believed that the woman is Rome or Roman Catholicism. I don't exclude that as a possibility, but let me just sh share with you some things uh, about that theory or about that belief that the Babylon is Rome. A couple of things. First of all, um, God is not geographically confused. I just want to say this. God is not geographically confused. You know, God knew, knows where Rome is. And He could easily in the Scripture have clarified. In other words, if Babylon is Rome, God could have just as easily, couldn't He? Couldn't the Holy Spirit just as easily have said Rome? 
instead of making an allegory that we have to read into and we have to understand. So I will uh, fairly adamantly state to you that geographically Babylon is not Rome and that's not the location here. Now there are many of us, matter of fact we've all been taught, haven't we, growing up that this is the Roman Catholic Church. And because Rome is the city on seven hills, and so this is the Roman Catholic Church. Let me give you something else interesting, or a couple of other thoughts. Prophecy is not precipitated by the present. Because in its very understanding, the very understanding about prophecy is that it's a future event. So things that happen in the future, uh, maybe things are happening in the present that are setting those things into place, but you don't know it to be absolutely so. For instance, Israel today, uh, genetically are God's chosen people, but what's going on in Israel today, God isn't doing. Do you hear me? You say, Pastor, God isn't, uh, God isn't protecting Israel. God is, no, God is preserving a nation. He's preserving a people. The geographic location of Israel and Jerusalem are very important to God. And those, these are the places where these events are eventually going to take place when Jesus Christ comes down and His feet touch the Mount of Olives. We know where that's at. You can go there today. You can see that place. You can go to the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, and you can see this place where the nations come out to war against God. Those are the places. But the people there... Maybe the, some of the actual people that survived for seven years and are part of these events. Probably they're not. Now, there, I can't say everything that could be said about this. If you read Ezekiel chapter 37 and you see the valley of the dry bones, you see that uh, Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the bones and when he prophesies, the bones all come together as bodies. And then prophesy again, and then flesh and sinew comes on the bones. And prophesy again, you know, and, and they, they, they are not alive yet, but when God breathes, or we prophesy to the wind, and the wind blows, then all of a sudden, they, the, the bodies, which were the valley of very dry bones, have come together, and they actually live. Israel certainly today is dry bones. Maybe there's some sinew or some flesh on those bones, but they're not the living nation which is prophesied to follow after God or the 144,000 people that have the seal of God in their foreheads. They will certainly be Jews. They are certainly descendants of Jews who are alive today. But do we know that the existing nation... Listen, the nation of Israel could be driven from Jerusalem today and God is able to lead in another nation like that. God can set up and take down a nation in an instance. Okay, in an instance. So, my point in saying this today is that these are not allegories in Revelation. The national Israel that we see someday may or not be uh, connected with Jerusalem that is there today. It really is not a significant event because in, for instance, Tel Aviv, did you know that the number one city in the world for witchcraft is Tel Aviv? The highest per capita worship of the devil is Tel Aviv. You know what the highest per capita city in the world uh, for homosexuality is? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Yeah, well, you could say Rome. Well, that's a pretty, yeah. It actually isn't. It actually isn't. You know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? And when you start looking at these things and you say, well, these, this is a godly nation. No, this is, these are the dry bones. They don't have the Spirit of God in them. They're not living. You understand that? Any person can be living the moment they receive Jesus as their Savior. And what I'm saying today isn't anti-Semitic. I'm not against national Israel at all. I'm for them. God's for them. They're the apple of His eye. You don't touch the apple of somebody's eye. Uh, God loves Israel. God's preserving them as a nation. And God wants all Israel to be saved. But the day that all Israel is going to be saved, it will be a godly nation. A God-fearing nation and Christ will be their Messiah. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, having said that, Rome is not Babylon. The Bible doesn't teach anywhere that Rome is Babylon. Okay, one more, last statistic. I looked this up today. Uh, did you know, uh, I didn't look this up today, but did you know that the population of the earth is now over 7 billion people? 
It's pushing 8 billion people. The last census are like 2015 and they're not accurate. The most accurate census last year has the world at nearly 8 billion people. And so there's a lot of people. Did you know that there are 2.8 Muslims in the world? I'm sorry. 2.8 Muslims. 2.8 billion Muslims. 2.8, yeah. Billion Muslims. Do you know how many all the Christian groups, if you classify Catholics, Protestants, and Evangelicals all into one group, you know how many there are? 2.1. 2.1 billion. Okay, so if you want to say that this great religion that the world is... You know, in other words, Catholicism was so big and so influential and so powerful. If you want to say the most influential religion is Rome and therefore Rome is Babylon, can I help you with something? What's the religion of Babylon today? What? Islam. Muslim. Okay. What's the most... What's the religion that has the, the biggest numbers uh, today? Islam. Islam. Okay, so the notion that because Catholicism is this massive corrupt religion which fits the description of all idolatrous religions makes it Babylon, first of all, is geographically, uh, geographically incorrect. And I just want to remind you, God knows geography. And he's, he's pretty able to say Rome if he means Rome. And so that isn't a major point uh, of the preaching of this text. But it's a point that has to be made pretty emphatically today because the church at large is just so off on it. And so it needs to be said sometimes. But I don't want to preach a message about what te a text doesn't say. I want to preach about what it does say. And so that's where we're at as, as we try to uh, dive in and finish up here today. All right, so let's look at this description. And we're just going to read through it. In verse 4, the Bible says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness uh, in her fornication. Of her fornication, verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. The word harlot, the word whore, uh, they're words that uh, <laughs> we're so politically correct we don't use, Right? In other words, we don't want to make anybody feel bad about anything. But the actual fact is that fornication is synonymous with idolatry in its context. And so what we're talking about here, it isn't the act of what we think of, of uh, the, the physical act of fornication. That isn't the point of it. What the point of it is, is the act with someone of a fleshly desire that is against God and against God godly desire, God's purpose. That's the point. In other words, to worship an idol isn't so much about the idol as it is the reality that I will not worship God. See, that's the point. What's the first of the Ten Commandments? I shall have no other gods before me. I shall have no other gods before me. Wouldn't it just be common sense that the true living God who is an actual creator would be worshipped <laughs> instead of a uh, made up imagination of man's heart. In other words, wouldn't it make sense that a real God who is the creator of mankind, the God of Israel, who delivered them with a mighty hand from Egypt. I mean, we're not talking about imaginary deliverance from Egypt. We're talking about two and a half million people being led out with a strong hand, the waters of the Red Sea being divided, and as Pharaoh and his army follow the uh, children of Israel into the Red Sea, the waters close up and they drown. A people that are slaves and servants would not have a chance of resisting Pharaoh. And God delivered them that way. Then led them into the wilderness where they were for 40 years because of their rebellion. And God didn't want to take a rebellious people into the promised land. But there for 40 years they are in the wilderness. And on a daily basis... God's presence is beside them physically as a cloud. And at night, God's presence is beside them as a pillar of fire. We're not talking about, you know, a little cloud. We're talking about a cloud that is the size of the camp. A pillar of fire that's the size of the camp. And that's God's presence. And then every morning when they come out of their tents, manna and quail falls on the ground and they have food. Now, wouldn't you think it was a little surprising if for 40 years food comes out of the sky and you pick it up on the ground? 
Two and a half million people worth of food for 40 years in a desert where there isn't enough food for one person. That's kind of significant when it comes to, when it, as regarding preservation of an entire nation. That's sort of miraculous, isn't it? That's the history of the nation. Your sandals don't wear out. God provides water out of a rock. That's literally what God did. That's the heritage of the nation of Israel. And then when He leads them into the promised land and He gives, uh, before they make their covenant with God, He gives Moses the law and the Ten Commandments that the children of Israel agreed to be their governing laws. And the first of the commandments that God gave was, Thou shalt have no other gods before Me. <coughs> Oughtn't it to be common sense? You know, if God did all this, maybe you shouldn't worship a fake God. Isn't it incredible that the first of the Ten Commandments even exists? Think of that. To me, it is incredible that the first of the Ten Commandments has to be written. It ought to be just common sense. If God's the true living God and if He's done all this for you, why would you worship another God? And yet, when Moses goes up in the mountain to meet with God, the first thing Aaron and the Israelites do is make a golden calf and say, These be thy gods which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And so evidently it is necessary. Why do men worship idols? What's the attraction of idolatry? Why was it the people were naked? Why is it that they were worshiping? What's fornication and idolatry? It is the desire of the flesh, of the wicked flesh, that is rebellion against God. You see that? In other words, it isn't about this act is so terrible. It's about this act is in God's face. God, not only will I not worship you, let me show you what I'm going to do for another God. And that's Babylon. See, so what's the attraction of this woman? That the kings, these ten kings of the earth, which have been given their power by the beast, or been given their dominions uh, by the dragon, or by the, by the beast, what is, it, what is the attraction to them? Why do they love this city, Babylon, so much? Well, the answer to that question is because that's the way their hearts are. In other words, their worship and their love and their affinity, their affection for the abominations and filthiness and fornication isn't because they're so much into the... I mean, they are, but it isn't so much that it's about the abominations, the filthiness, and the fornication. It's because it's thumbing their uh, finger in God's eye. In other words, this is anti-God. It is. Now, one last thing, one last thought, if you will, about Babylon. You say, Pastor... Babylon really, you know, it's in Iraq and it's really not that great of a city today. No, it's not. Um, anybody ever heard of Dubai? Anybody ever just looked at what's going on in Dubai right now? I'm not saying Babylon's Dubai, but uh, I don't want to go there just because of, of the Islam. To be honest with you, I'd probably get killed. Uh, but Dubai is a pretty amazing place. You ever just done a, a Google satellite look at Dubai or ever done like one of these tours? of Dubai. It's the, in my opinion, it's the most magnificent city on earth. Now I know some people say St. Petersburg and uh, you know there's different cities that people think are incredible cities. Uh, <clears throat> Dubai is, 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 should be desert, should be wilderness. And it's one of the most beautiful places. It has, is it the, does it have the tallest size building in the, in the world now or is it China that has? Is it China that has the tallest building? Dubai, Dubai does. Yeah, Dubai does. has the tallest building in the world now. And I mean you talk about the wealth the incredible wealth. There are literally uh, men that live in Dubai that fly jets around town. I mean, that's they go from place to place by jet in the city rather than by car. I mean, it's just it's just the the wealth of it defies the imagination. That's where they have the mall now that has an indoor ski park, you know, in the in the desert. Well, I mean, a snow ski place. Yeah, they just just the things in Dubai are absolutely incredible. And when I was a kid. You know, the United Arab Emirates really just wasn't that big of a thing. But it is today, and it's all happened in the last 20 years. What I'm saying is, is that Babylon, geographically, is one of the most coveted places on earth. It has some of the greatest riches, some of the greatest treasures. But more than that, it's going to be the place, I believe, that the Scripture describes as this great city that holds all this filthiness in it. And has the 
all these abominations. It's going to be a very beautiful, very attractive city that's built someday. It's important for us to realize. You say, Pastor, how long will it take for that to happen? Oh, I don't know, five years? It's going to be a place that everybody in the world wants to go to. It's going to be a place that all the ten kings of the earth, the world will be divided up into ten kingdoms, and the ten kings of the earth, it's going to be the place they get together and party. It's going to be the culmination of the most wicked place on the earth, and all of them will have as their god or as their ruler and their universal religion. What will the religion be? Well, I think it will be a combination of all the religions of the world. It will be Islam probably and Catholicism probably and all the isms and, and the ists and all the different religions of the world will all be together into one. And every religion's sole purpose and point will be to worship the dragon instead of God. And the lust of all the religions will be the blood of the saints. The sacrifices of all these religions will be the blood of the saints. That will be the thing that they desire, that they thirst after. They want more than anything else. You say, Pastor, that is disgusting. How do you come up with something like that? I actually don't. But you know what Satan worshipers desire today? Blood. They love blood. And uh, it's just, it's just you know, you look at it and you just think, I can't relate to that. No, you can't because you can't relate to not worshiping God. So many years ago, I realized I cannot actually understand a rebel. In other words, I can, I can take their position. We talked about this morning how we can understand something, even something that somebody's wrong about. And we just talked about something all of us can understand. Can you understand why someone would want to not work and get paid? Can anybody here understand that? How many of you would like to not work and get paid for it? Yeah, all of us would, right? Let's understand. Now, let me ask you a question, though. Is that right? No, it isn't right. It's understandable, but it's not right. Rebellion is similar to that for me. In other words, I can understand where a person who doesn't want to worship God is coming from. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to bow before God. I can understand their position, but it doesn't make it right or reasonable. And so, sometimes we try to be so relatable that we say, well, I understand and that's valid. No, it's understandable, but it's invalid. That's the deal with rebellion. Okay, now, let's look at the description of this woman. In verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and is. Don't have much time, uh, but if you want to cross-reference, you could cross-reference Daniel and chapter 11, the first several verses. Uh, I, did I say chapter 11? I, I think I intended to say yeah, Daniel chapter 12. But you could read Daniel chapter 11. That would be a parallel portion of the Scripture to where we're at. You can see this prophecy uh, of the, the nation of Israel finally coming to, into an everlasting covenant with God and the nations of the earth coming into their place of judgment. We are really almost out of time already. We are really out of time. So let's move on with the description and we'll come up with our, we'll look at our final application this morning. In verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Okay, the seven heads on seven mountains. Rome is the city of seven hills and that's where we find the coincidence for it. I'm sorry, but that just isn't enough for the Bible not to mean what it says. You understand my position there? And by the way, I'm not... Um, this isn't a, a fellowship point for me with anybody. So you have to agree with my position that, that Babylon is not Catholicism and it's not Rome. Um, I, I'm fine with you believing that. It's, it's just that it contradicts Scripture. That's the only issue that I have with that. Uh, it's just that the Bible is pretty clear about what it actually says. And we try to make a prophecy on the basis of present day events. And this is a future event. And all I'm saying is God can raise up the nation of Israel and God can raise up Babylon. Both of those things don't exist today. That does not mean they will not exist during the seven years of tribulation. Get that? Or is, 
the fact that those things don't meet those descriptions today does not mean that they will not. They absolutely 100% for sure will. Just as every prophecy of the Scripture about the Messiah was 100% fulfilled, every future prophecy about national Israel will one day be fulfilled as well. Okay? Uh, verse 11, The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, that goeth into perdition. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Now stop here for a second, will you? Ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Okay, so there are ten kings which don't yet have their kingdoms. Well, pastor, here are who the ten kings are going to be. They don't exist. The kingdoms that are described here are future kingdoms. They have not existed. They do not exist. And so you cannot tell me what nations, what peoples make up the kingdoms. Back in the 1980s during the Cold War and when Saddam Hussein uh, was making big noise in Iraq, uh, I, have, I have books from the 1980s that talk about how Saddam Hussein is the real life Nebuchadnezzar. And you know what? He's not. He isn't. He's dead. Saddam Hussein is not this future guy. It's not someone who's alive, it's someone who will be alive. You get that? The kingdoms that were talked about do not exist today, but they will exist. And that's what the Scripture herein says. And that's as plain as the nose on your face if you'd like to not just try to interpret the Scripture from what you know, but try to know what you know from interpreting the Scripture the way it's written. And that's the way we study the Bible. Uh, These shall make war with the Lamb, the Lamb shall overcome them. This is the understatement of the century. For he is Lord of Lords, capital L of, uh, compared to small L Lords, King of Kings, capital King of King, compared to small K Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And now here's the waters. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beasts. These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, <coughs> until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. You say, Pastor, it's Rome. No, it's not. It's Babylon. That's what the Bible says, and that's what it indicates. Verse 1, chapter 18. After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This is a major picture of what Sodom and Gomorrah was when God told the righteous to come out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it was only Lot and his wife and his daughters. And then even his wife turned back because she loved Sodom. This is... To, uh, this is exponentially greater than that. Verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, fill her up to her double. And uh, we're seeing more of the judgment. Verse 9, The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off from the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Can I stop here for a second for a little bit of lightness? I recommend you don't invest in property uh, in this region. This is my recommendation. Now, I won't tell you how I have it, but I have a sequoia pine cone. And, uh, man, I, I heard it's not legal, so i got to figure out a way to do it legally, something that's not legal. But I want to plant it somewhere in Jerusalem. I want to uh, kind of stake my claim. A sequoia tree doesn't really die off. They live for thousands of years. So if I can get it to take in Jerusalem, you know, just like, you know, in New Zealand, they have redwood forests. Where did they get the redwood forests? Well, they planted them from the United States. They took 
redwood seeds and planted them there. Well, I want a sequoia tree, or a couple of them, in uh, Jerusalem. And that way, after all these events happen and it becomes prime real estate, I'm going to go there and say, you know, this is my property. I planted that tree. And so this is like a family tree here. And so this is part of my inheritance. I'm going to stake out a claim. But I'm not going to do that in Babylon. Because this city is going to be destroyed. Got it? Okay. I, that's being a little bit silly. But I want us to understand the literal aspect of this. Uh, one, one last thing, literally. I don't agree with this individual, but a, but a pastor by the name of, of Ralph Sexton uh, some years ago went to Masada. And when they were there, they, they uh, buried a bunch of Bibles in Masada in the hopes that during the seven-year tribulation when people are trying to figure out what's going on, uh, that when, when national Israel is, flees into the desert, that that will be the place that, that uh, she'll go for protection and she'll, that, the, that the Israelites there will find the Scripture and they'll be converted by the Scripture that's there. Now, there are a couple of flaws with that thinking that I won't go into here today, but the reality of it is, is that I appreciate, I value their faith and the fact that they take the Scripture very literally because everything that is prophesied in the Scripture is not allegorical, it's actual. It's real. Jesus Christ wasn't, you know, the, the, the realization of a very good man who spiritually fulfilled some things. No, Jesus was God. He was born of a virgin. And He came to earth and He fulfilled every single prophecy of the Scripture literally as they were written. Amen. And my friend, I just want to tell you something. This book is literally true. Every single word of it. And God's promised that all the words, all the prophecies of the Scripture are true. Is so. And so that's how we ought to go to the Scripture. We do not allegorize revelation, my friend. We take it literally. Unless it says to allegorize it. When it says this is like this, or as this, then that's an allegorization or a comparison term. When the Bible tells us something is like something, it's because we can't relate to what it's actually like, so here's how we could understand it by it being illustrated as a comparison. But where it's written literally, and it is here, it literally is what it is written to be. You get that? Okay. I've asked that a lot today. It almost sounds like I'm talking down to you, and that's not the tone in which I'm preaching from here today. All right. I want to go to verse 18. We're way out of time. Uh, the Bible says, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. <coughs> so she burns, and everybody stands afar off and just cries over her. They're mourning. They are absolutely devastated because this city is judged. We're not going to make it past this point here today. I wanted to go further. But let's stop here and let's make some good application, shall we? You know what ought to devastate us? Not wickedness being destroyed, but wickedness itself. What we ought to cry over, what we ought to mourn over, is idolatry not when the idol is destroyed. Because idolatry, my friend, is a sign that the worship of the true living God has been supplanted by something which is phony, fake, and will ultimately meet just, right, righteous judgment. You know what we ought to mourn over? We ought to mourn over our sins. Too many times individuals are upset by the consequences of sin, but they're never upset by what their sin is. When a perfect Lamb of God was sacrificed so that they could be without sin. I don't know how many times I've counseled Christians who are undergoing consequences for things that they know are sin in their lives. And the words that they say first to me are, I don't want anyone to think... In other words, they're not upset about what has been done. They're upset about their embarrassment on the basis of what other people who are also sinners <coughs> think about them. And it is a sure diagnosis to me that they don't mourn over their sin. They mourn instead over the destruction of their sin, 
In other words, it didn't work out. Now they're finding consequences for their sin. And the shame bothers them, but the sin doesn't. True repentance is when we come to a place when we see a perfect God, a righteous, holy God, who is perfect in His mercy, who is perfect in His long-suffering, who is perfect in His love toward us, affronted by the wickedness, the, the, how despicable, how hateful, how in your face to God our sin actually is. And the very concept of what this city is, is look at this God. In other words, it isn't done to escape God. It's done against God. And God isn't evil. And God isn't isn't to be hated. My friend, when the first man sinned, he became God's enemy, and God's response was to provide a sacrifice for him so that he didn't have to be God's enemy. In other words, God's attitude towards sinful man is one of, I want you to be reconciled to me. I love you. <clears throat> one of those scriptures that every year of my life impresses me more, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That is, God loved me not when I was cute, kind, uh, desiring good. God loved me when I was wicked and sacrificed His lovely Son who was godly, who pleased Him in everything, who never sinned, and God gave His Son who was perfect for me, who am the exact opposite of everything that Jesus is. And God sacrificed His perfect Son for me. And friend, when we sin, we are scorning, we are scoffing at the cross. We are mocking the sacrifice that was made on Calvary for sin. And when individuals cry over the loss or over the judgment that comes from sin, when individuals shake their fist at God because of death, which is not a consequence of God's desire, it's a consequence of sin. They're angry at God for something. What they're angry about isn't that they've done evil. What they're angry about is that they've had consequence for evil. And friends, sometimes even as believers, we have an unrepentant heart toward our sin. Even though we're covered by the blood, we're living in sin and we're upset when our sin is taken from us because we love our sin instead of loving God. And this is the indictment of the wickedness of the nation who, though they can, with their eyes, see God. <clears throat> literally see God. They will not bow to Him. They will not worship Him. And they mourn when their wickedness is taken from them. And friend, to this I have to say, all God can do with people like that is destroy them. You know all God can do with unrepentant sinners is give them what they want. Blood. Blood. That's disgusting, isn't it? When God gave us the blood of His perfect Son to satisfy His wrath. Father, I thank You. I thank You for Jesus. And I thank You for their perspective that this gives us of the rebellious of the nations. God, help us not to give the benefit of the doubt to the wicked. God, help us not to think, well, you know, God is harsh to judge sin. God is, God is hateful. No, my friend, uh, no, uh, all of us, when we say this about God, God, when we say this about you, we're, we're saying that you're evil. And you're not, God, you're good. And we're evil. And the wicked are evil and we deserve judgment. So God, I just thank you for your mercy toward those that believe. And God, I have to say about these things, though they are hard for me to be able to witness and see that, God, you're good, and my desire is that you come quickly and you execute righteous judgment. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Tosh, you have a question? Member of ICU. Well, why don't you come up here? What about everyone? Does she, do you want to be a member of the church? Yeah, you want to judge? Come on up. Yeah. This is how complicated this is, folks. <laughs>
Tasha and Ariel have been coming for a year now, hasn't yeah. it? It's yeah. over a year. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Tasha, you know for sure that you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Yeah, I do. You're born again? You've been scripturally baptized? Yes. Okay. Here. Yeah. Oh, I baptized you? No, you baptized oh. me, yeah. Okay. Same for you. Have you been baptized? No. No? Okay, so you'll need to do that. Um, have you been born again? You trusted Jesus as your Savior? Yeah. Yeah. And how long ago was that? Um, like four or five years ago. Okay. All right, I know she shared that with us before, and they've given a good testimony of their salvation. We want them to be members of this church and be fully involved. So if you rejoice in their coming, would you say amen? Amen. 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 All right, we're going to dismiss, and why don't you come by and congratulate them uh, at, at, at the end of the service. Yeah, go ahead. We want you to be a member of our church, and if you say, well, Pastor, I want to join too, we'll just go right on ahead. You're welcome. We'd love to. Love to have you. All right, why don't you, um, we'll have Charlie dismiss us with prayer. Why don't we go to the back door and make sure you shake their hand and tell them how glad you are to have them as part of this local body. All right, let's All right. be dismissed. Charlie, dismiss us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the truth that we learn. Father, I pray that we'd ever be mindful uh, to have a heart that's pure before you, Lord, to have you as our focus, and Lord, not be distracted, not be caught up in idolatry, Lord. Uh, what you say is fornication, and Lord, uh, grieve your heart in that manner. I pray for uh, those, Lord, as well, that we would come into contact with that are in bondage of sin. Lord, that we'd be ever faithful to uh, give good, clear testimony to them of, Lord, your saving grace and how you want to change their life. And I pray now also that you'd uh, let's get back home safe, uh, make it back here tonight safe as well, uh, to learn more from your word. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.